Well, this is Warlick William. I'm Paula Pena. And you're introducing the show. This is great. I was taking I it away it. from you. I'm Father Sam Kachuba. Fantastic. Paula, I have missed you. <laughs> Did you, though? I had two straight weeks without you, and I had to record other things. That's okay, but you recorded with really awesome people. We had some fun with Samantha Kelly and with Sean Forrest. Yes, it was it was a good time. I'm excited to hear them. It was a good time. Yeah, um, so... Well, by the time this one goes out, people will have already heard them, and so will you. Oh, fantastic. Isn't this is true. Okay, so seeing as I did a total mess up at the beginning of this, I was just thinking, what are Catholic things that you have done outside of church that have been noticed as weird and awkward? So <laughs> Catholic, th you mean like very Catholic things that I've, I've participated in or? That you've just accidentally done. For example, when you leave the movie theater, you genuflect. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. I, <laughs> that has I happened to yeah. me many times. Yeah, kind of the instinctual genuflection because you're in an aisle and there's there's a row of seats. Yeah, exactly. I, I totally understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me see. I'd, I'd have to think a little bit about some things that I have done, super Catholic, that would look weird outside of church. Um, well, I, I don't know. I'm kind of in a strange position. Oh, yeah, you are. As, as a priest, the fact that I'm out there at all can look kind of strange to people. Uh, I... I, did I ever tell you the story about the bowling pin? No. So I was I was in New York City one day, and I was walking down the street, and I was wearing my collar. I'm walking down the street, and up ahead of me, a a man dressed as a bowling pin walked uh, onto the sidewalk. So there was an eight foot tall bowling pin walking down the street, <laughs> and as this guy in his bowling pin costume is walking down the street, uh, I see a girl on the on the street corner, and she takes her phone out. And she holds it up, and I think she's going to take a picture of the guy in a bowling pin costume because this is unusual. Yeah. There's just a bowling – there's no other reason for a bowling pin to be walking down the street. There was no cameras or – there was. this wasn't a photo shoot. This is just a guy in an eight-foot-tall bowling pin costume walking down the street, which it's New York City, so we don't judge. It's just happening, right? This right, right. This is just a thing that's going on. Exactly. And uh, so the guy's walking down the street, and this gives you a, a sense of, of when this all happened because as I got up, the, the girl still was holding her phone up, and I realized that she was taking my picture because I heard the click of the the camera thing, you know, because that's that was when all your cameras, even on your phone, still made noise. Yeah. And I realized I was the thing that she needed to take a picture of that day because I was the weirdest thing on the street of New York. The eight foot tall bowling pin, not as weird as the Catholic priest walking down the street. So, even though it's New York City and exactly. it's like there are Catholic priests everywhere. No, that day I was the freak. And, <laughs> Are you in Times Square? No, I was not in Times Square. I was not in Times Square. Although uh, there was a day when I was vocation director. We had the vocation director convention, which is a thing. The National Conference of Diocesan Vocation Directors met in Long Island for their, their annual convention. And so a group of us who had been in seminary together from all over the country, mostly guys from the Midwest, yeah. uh, we all decided to go into the city uh, on the free day. So one of the guys was from New Jersey, myself. We were the only two who had ever actually been to New York City. Oh, no, there was a guy from Maine who had also been to New York before. But at least me and the guy from New Jersey kind of knew our way around. And all the guys from the, from the Midwest were like, well, we have to go to Times Square. And me and <laughs> Father Mike Romano from New Jersey said, no, we really don't. No, there's no need. <laughs> there's no reason to go to Times Square. We can skip that entirely and be very happy. No, no, we've got to go see it. Fine. So we agreed to go and see it. So we get into Times Square, and there's a guy um, who's holding – a big sign about how the end of the world is coming. And he's standing there and he's kind of shouting the, the message and that the, the end of the world is coming. And he sees us, 11, 12 priests in collars come around the corner and he drops the sign and he runs over to us and he goes, brothers, this is great. <laughs> and he says, come here, I wanna pray with you. I wanna pray with you. So he puts his Was fist- Was he Catholic? Yeah, no, no, no. But like he just, he just gets there and he, and he puts his fist in the middle. He goes, get in. And so we like huddle up around this guy. We all have our, our hands in the middle with him and we pray the Our Father together. And then he goes, Jesus on three. <laughs> One, two, three. And so that was how we, we kicked off our, uh, oh my gosh. yeah, the rest of our day in New York City. It, oh. was, it was an adventure. And we, we were That's stopped great... several times also to find out if we were real. Like wow. pe pe people stop, is this like a video? Are you guys just trying to, to prank people? Or oh is this, is, no, we said we're, we're actually priests and we're, we're uh, yeah, we are walking down the street. It's a, it's a real thing. We're, walking down we're real street. actual things. That's so yeah. funny. Yeah. Oh. So I guess that would be, see, that's the, the experience that I would have as a priest where yeah. like accidentally things like that happen when I'm just trying to be normal. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not actually doing anything at all. I, I'm just there 
and it, it happens that way. Yeah. One time I was leaving my dorm room in college and there was a habit of me to genuflect every time I walked into the Catholic center to say hi to Jesus. And then I was leaving my dorm room, you know, cause I'm leaving a building, I'm leaving a room. I literally genuflect as I'm leaving. And my sweet mate who is not Catholic just stares at me. She's like, what? And I was like, goodbye. Like I'm not, I didn't have, I didn't want to answer what I just <laughs> did because my body was so used to making sure. like movements. <laughs> got a, oh, I, I saw a, a staple on the ground. Yeah, I no, wanted to pick it up just, before somebody stepped on a barefoot. Just that's go all. on down on one knee at the doorway. And yeah, so that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I was thinking about when I started saying bless us. So I was like, oh yeah, I remember yeah. I did that once and it's happened to me many times. I love it. Yeah. But I haven't been in a movie theater in a very long time. Uh, so That's probably better. Yeah. All right. So you were gone for two weeks. I have so much to share. I was forced to, to podcast with others. And that was about all I did in the two Forced. weeks that I was gone. Forced. Wow. I actually thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it. I was going to say. Super grateful to Sam and to Sean for, for coming on here. It was, it was a lot of fun. But uh, what were you doing in those two weeks that you were away? Because this was not vacation. This was not. People... Week one. Tell me, tell me, where were you week one? <laughs> okay, to preface this, I literally walked outside to get something from my car, and a prisoner walked up to me, and she goes, oh, how was your vacation? I was like, it was not. <laughs> it was not. <laughs> I was in very sunny Florida and very sunny Arizona, and it was beautiful. So both of those places, it would seem Vacation logical. spots. Yeah, exactly. It totally makes sense, right. but I was not. All so, right, so week one, Week where one, I was in very sweaty Florida. I was at Ave Maria University, um, and I was going – through a spiritual director training with Focus. It was great. They had a, com a couple of nights that they invited back. Um, you had to be at least 30 years old, have lived your faith for a very substantial amount of time, growing in prayer, and you were invited back to be trained to be spiritual directors for the first year missionary silent retreat. That was beautiful. So that was about four days. Then the next four days, I flew to Arizona for the Life Teen National Youth Ministry Convention. It was cool. awesome. Nice. So much happened in eight days. All right. So tell me in week one, week one, what was the most important thing you learned from <laughs> your spiritual director training? That Jesus is Lord. No, I'm going to go into more specifics. So one of the things was you're going into spiritual direction. And the first thing you think to yourself, well, why am I being invited into spiritual direction? Really asking the Lord, like, are you sure? <laughs> is this my thing? Because usually when you think of spiritual direction, you really think of it in terms of just priests or religious. That was always my attitude towards it, that I don't trust anybody. If you're, if you're not in a habit and not a collar, like, or if I don't know you very well and that you move with the spirit, it's when I, when I think about it, I want to move with somebody. Paula trusts no one. That's the main takeaway. Today. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> That's not, especially with matters of like spirituality and sure. prayer, you know, that you associate with that. So the well, idea, I want to interrupt you right there. Yeah. Okay. Because that sense of, of wanting to be very careful with who you trust with these important spiritual matters, that's not unhealthy. No, of course. There's good reason for that, right? right. You want to trust somebody who you know has a prayer life, who you know is, is striving to follow the Lord. You, you don't want to just share spiritual things with anyone mm -hmm. because who knows where they might be coming from or, or where they might lead you if you're trying to entrust your heart to them. Exactly. You've got to, you've got to be actually very selective. So that, that's actually yeah. good wisdom. That's, and, that's a good practice. And there's a lot in the history of the church where you'll see if people don't have the right spiritual directors, um, they don't necessarily grow in the ways that they need to and get moved in different directions based on maybe somebody's own personal views or, you know, I'm going to take you down this path. Like, I don't know, sure. there was the saint who wanted to be religious and it was a priest that she was meeting with, but he made her marry like somebody else, like somebody that he knew. But she still joyfully went through everything and think, you know, took it on. So that's a huge tangent. So the idea with this, um, with this whole spiritual director training program, we had classes um, every Wednesday in, in since March, just learning about the spiritual life, the movement of the spiritual life, people's temperaments. Um, habitual sin, how to really enter into people's story. So in other words, since, since March, you've actually been doing the training. Yes. It just intensified. Now this was a in-person, yeah, now this was an in-person okay. part of the training. Cool. And then you had an actual training. So you were given two directees for the weekend. Um, I hadn't stepped foot on Ave Maria in seven years. The last time I was there was in 2014. And it still looks like the Truman Show when you walk onto this place. Uh, and it was incredible to see, one, God calls 
and what I'm realizing and what focus is, what I see focus doing is they're recognizing this call from the Holy Spirit to really raise up more lay leaders to be spiritual directors. Mm-hmm. And the example they gave, which gave me a lot of comfort, was the story of Jan Tiernowski. <clears throat> For those who don't know this name, many people actually don't. Nobody knows who this guy is. This guy was a Polish tailor um, in the early part of the 1900s. And he held a rosary group where he had just a couple of guys. He would meet with them every week, pray the rosary, and really form them. And one of the people in the group was Kara Wojtyla. And it was because of Jan Tiernowski's um, involvement in just bringing a group together for fellowship and prayer, but also in a way forming these men to answer the call um, and just to be open to where the Holy Spirit was leading them, that Kara Wojtyla now later on, known as St. John, John Paul II, was able to answer that call to the priesthood. And and I love how they use that example. Like, you don't have to be this super recognizable person in the sense that you have, like, orders in order to do this. But sure. as long as you're willing to live holy lives um, and you're pursuing them, you're pursuing a relationship with Jesus, you can do that. My thing that I love the most, um, and I think this was really brilliant on their part, they made sure that they picked people who were over 30. Why? Because when you're first fresh off a conversion at 18, 20, 21, you know nothing, okay? Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> you, very true. You think you know something, and you don't. And that only comes with time, and time gives you wisdom. Yeah. Because you need time to fail, you need time to mess up, you need time to surrender and experience God's mercy in your life. And that I was just, so I remember sitting in that chapel the first day I went to go do a holy hour before like we were going to meet up for dinner and our first night. And I remember sitting in that chapel and all I could think about were all the fears, the insecurities and the hurts that I carried the last time I was there and recognizing that they no longer existed, Mm -hmm. that I had grown emotionally, spiritually and mentally in ways that I actually thought at that time that I would never be free of. And to see how I was able to arrive back at Ave Maria as a different person. And I'm going to cry because it's so beautiful, but like God kept his promise that he makes us a new creation, especially when we don't think that it's happening. And that was so amazing. So that's what started off that whole week at the spiritual director training. First recognizing God, you kept your promise and you truly do make things new. And you then know, the rest of the yeah. It's interesting you're talking about that that influence of of a lay person <clears throat> who takes the spiritual life seriously and who can help to guide people in other ways. One of the things that I talked about with Sean Forrest mm-hmm. was how his influence in my life was so important, mm-hmm. and how he's the one who introduced me to Eucharistic adoration to the to the Rosary, and in a, in a very very real way, he is a key instrument in my vocation to the priesthood. If not for my encounter with Sean, if not for getting to know him and his leadership and his mentorship, I'm not sure that I'd, I'd be here right now. So, yeah, you see the value of that mm-hmm. of, that, of that person, and and this is the thing, and I think it's, it's something the church has always understood, and has always believed, but in practice, it hasn't always been clear. Right. When you look at, at for example, in Lumen Gentium and the universal call to holiness mm-hmm. that the Second Vatican Council calls for. It's something that's always been present in the life of the church. There's never been a time when people are not called to holiness. Mm-hmm. Everyone is always called to the perfection of charity, is called to, to be holy. But there was in practice the sense that if you were going to become holy, if you were going to become a saint, you had to be a nun or a priest. Right. And in fact, the church has never taught that, has right. never believed that, has always encouraged people to holiness. And when you look at the the lists of saints, you'll often find even kings and princes and princesses and queens, and you'll find ordinary lay people, you'll find uh, priests, you'll find religious, you find it all. Like Catherine of Siena gets mistaken for being a nun, but she was right, a lay she was person. Third order. Right. Yeah. But so the the that important aspect that all of us really are called to this, and that the church really does teach this, just in practice, it's not always remembered. To be reminded of that, I think, is is very powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was so good. And I, that was the thing that the Lord wanted me to see at the beginning. So then we went through our classes. We met with a couple of first year missionaries <clears throat> and it wasn't until the end of the retreat that I truly recognized the gift of entering into this spiritual direction, what it was for. Because when, so they made a whole cheat sheet for, um, the missionaries as to what spiritual direction is. Spiritual direction gets confused with it being therapy or with it being discipleship. And it is not that. It is simply you are with somebody who's older than you, wiser than you, 
who is helping you to become aware of the movements of grace in your life. Right. So what is discipleship? So discipleship is when you walk with somebody one-on-one -on -one to grow in, so in, in a way you're sharing life with each other. Um, so whether that's uh, formally or informally, um, you're sharing like, okay, hey, like let's have time, like where we spend, go out to eat and just kind of share life together. But also formally is, okay, I'm challenging you with um, growing in these virtues and keeping you accountable and doing that. So it's, <clears throat> it's more of an intimate friendship Spiritual direction has a degree of friendship in it, but there's there's boundaries there. Sure. So it it can't be lived in the same way, mm -hmm. and and there's a distinction there. And um, I was talking to a missionary or former missionary yesterday, and that was one of the pitfalls he saw a lot of missionaries into was they would end up going to spiritual direction thinking that it was discipleship. Yeah. And they would not walk in their own discipleship because you do need dis you need community for discipleship. I remember a, a priest friend of mine when I was going into major seminary and, and getting ready to have a new spiritual director, he said, look, what you should be looking for in the spiritual director is not a friend, right? Your spiritual director is not your friend. It's not going to be the same as your relationship with, with this person or with, with, you know, this seminarian or with this priest who you already know who you're friends with. Mm -hmm. You have to have a rapport, mm -hmm. but rapport and friendship are two very different things. Yes. And so look for the, the good rapport that allows you to, to be in a position where you trust and you know that they that there there's a a freedom that you have to share but this isn't your friend this isn't somebody that you're trying to hang out with on the weekends <laughs> right so, exactly this is somebody that you can talk to who can who you, you'll take their advice mm -hmm. because you get along well but that's that's where it needs yeah. to stop and it's good that they express that yeah. And I'm and so glad they wrote that out. And I was like, oh my gosh, this also focus just keeps getting better and better in every year. <laughs> so I looked at like, oh, these were things I wish that I had a little bit more, you know, the clarity, but you know what? It's fine. Um, so that was really helpful to have. And one of the things that they wrote in there is um, they explained who you can have spiritual direction with. And so it said like, you can have spiritual direction with a priest, religious or holy lay person. And I took that last part to prayer, holy lay person. And I was like, holy Jesus, lay person, Batman. Jesus. <laughs> no, no. It was just like, Jesus, I'm not holy because all I kept thinking, and this was what some of us, um, who were directing, were kind of struggling with at the beginning with was, yeah, but, but we struggle. We know where we fall. Sure. We know like the things that we struggle with and like God is still calling us. And so when I was in prayer uh, and this was after my last session with one of the missionaries, I was just talking to Jesus and and there was this recognition, this beautiful freedom of abandonment to recognize that in the moments where I was in a session with somebody, I felt so small, but in a beautiful way, because it wasn't me directing the person. It was Jesus himself. And it's not me who is holy, but it's Jesus inside of me that's holy. Yeah. And, and it was this freedom to um, just allow God to dwell in me. And so, cause something, as much as something is happening for the person in spiritual direction, like something is happening to you too, as the director, uh, God is also being made present. And, you know, you might see something that somebody's struggling with and you're like, and that is made more clearly, like made more clear to you. You're like, oh yeah, like that's spiritual truth. Yeah. Okay. That just got embedded in me a little bit more deeply. Yeah. A lot of times spiritual direction is you're listening yeah. to whatever the person is, is saying to you. You're listening to them tell their story, talk about what they're what they're struggling with, what they're succeeding with. And really all you are is a sounding board. Right. You're, you're meant to reflect back to them what right. they just said. Right, because it's not about the director. Right. It's about the directee. Well, and so often what, what you end up doing is reflecting back to them something that they said, mm -hmm. but they didn't hear. Yeah. So those words came out of their mouth. <laughs> right. I'm struggling with this because of this. And you say, it sounds like you're struggling with this because of this. And they go, how did you know? <laughs> because you just said it. As, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they, yeah. didn't, they didn't hear the, that spiritual truth. Yeah. They didn't hear it in the same way. And when you reflect it back to them, or, or sometimes it's something that they can't put into words, mm -hmm. but you're able to reflect back to them. Have you thought about this? Yeah. Um, I remember being asked as I was going through a, a particular challenge uh, with, with a situation and I was talking with the spiritual director about it. And he looked at me and he said, are you disappointed in the father? Are you disappointed in God, the father? And in my mind, I've never had an issue with God, the father. In my mind, everything's always been really great. And we have a, a wonderful relationship. <laughs> Things are fine. I, I don't have father issues or anything like that. I'm like, every, this is fine. Mm -hmm. 
But when he asked me that, mm. it was this very penetrating insight. And it wasn't instant. Yeah. But it became something that I thought to reflect on. And I realized that I was holding something against God the Father. Mm. And it was a strange experience for me mm -hmm. and kind of painful for me to recognize that I was doing that because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to. Right. But it was the kind of thing that he heard. He heard it in what I was saying. Yes. He heard it in what I was talking about. And, and he saw the pattern. Right. In the situation that I was describing, he saw the pattern and he knew the pattern from other experiences and from the other things that he knows about the spiritual life. And he was able to ask me that question so that I could come to a place of, uh, well, in, in a, a real way of, of repentance yeah, uh, and turning away from that and a place of surrender where I could say, all right, Lord, I don't want to hold this against you anymore. But it was because he was able, this, this spiritual director was able to identify something that I couldn't see. Right but I needed to hear. Cause when you're in your own head, you don't know what's happening. And that was the other thing. It, there's a delicate balance. You have to become aware of what this person is saying. You have to be aware of if the things that they're saying, are they coming from their own humanity or is it coming from the evil one? What's the Holy spirit saying to you? Um, like at one point the Holy spirit asked me to ask us a very specific question that touched their heart in the way that need, they needed it. So there's a lot of things that are happening all at once, but everything is grace. And once they leave, Grace is going to do the rest. Um, the most enlightening thing about that entire experience. Now, go back to my comment about how 21 and 19 year olds, especially off fresh of a conversion, like, you know, you're just ready. You have so much energy. You're just like, this is amazing. Like, and you think you know a lot. <laughs> and, um, and I love this. There was what there was a priest who was there who was leading one of our classes. He went to Yale and then he went to MIT. So this guy's very smart, you know, probably, like, probably an intelligent human. So he said, you guys are going to be dealing with people who are not even beginners in the prayer life. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, they're not even beginners. They're pre beginners. Okay. Yeah. And that was a little bit comforting. So he explained it a little bit more. He goes, you are dealing with people whose most of their things is a lack of human formation. It's a lack of maturity over their emotions, a lack of maturity, um, in, in their prayer life. They haven't done it substantially enough. Um, you know, when you you become seasoned, you know, sure. over time. And that was incredible because then you take the biological part of the brain not being fully formed until you're 25. Okay. That just explained my entire first three years as a missionary, why I was all over the place, why I was struggling with abstract thinking, why I couldn't like move forward every time I felt insecure or hurt or whatever was because of the lack of my own human formation. Now there were wounds attached to that as well, but it was just so very vivid. Like, do, I, do you think it was lack of human formation or simply that there was an element of your human formation that still had yet to be accomplished? Okay. It had not yet matured. Yeah. Right. Because there's, so, there's, if you're Lack acting is, like a 21 year old, I'm glad you're acting like a 20 year old when you're 21. Right. If you're 30 and acting like a 21 year old, I have questions about your human formation. That's true. A 21 year old who's behaving like a 21 year old. Okay, great. You're, you are typical of, of your age. That's the right place to be. Right. But mm -hmm. if you can't, if you can't stop doing that by the time you're 30, then we, we need to address that. Right. And that's something <laughs> that only time can give. All right. So you're talking yeah. about though, in this particular context, pre-beginners, meaning they're pre-beginners both in their human formation yeah. because they're still just getting started. They are, in fact, young. Right. And so you're working with young people who need to be taken th to that next step. But in spiritual direction, it's if, if you're giving spiritual direction, like you need to be aware of the age of the person that you're giving direction right. to because that's going to influence things. Right. But you can also have somebody who is likewise a pre-beginner but who in their human formation is far more advanced. Exactly. If you're, if you're doing spiritual direction with somebody who's older, uh, they might, again, in their prayer life, still just be getting started, still mm -hmm. learning how to contemplate, how to enter into silence, right. how to sit before the Lord in the Eucharist, just learning the discipline of a prayer life. Right, right. right. And they are very much beginners, but in their human formation, they have a lot more. So do you think that that would help them to make progress faster in spiritual I, direction? Or do you not have the experience with enough people who are older yet, having done mostly these college students or just immediate post-college Just immediate post-college. Well, the one thing I want to highlight, though, is this confusion of um, when we struggle in prayer, um, we consider it desolation. Sure. But desolation comes – it just the way that it got explained, there's consolations and desolations. And – somebody might come to you and say like, I'm having a dark night of the soul. 
the P the priest was like, no, you're not. Oh, yeah. You just started prayer. You have not been praying oh, for yeah. 20 years, and God has removed right. this <laughs> consolation yeah. from your life. Oh, no, so uh, when I was a high school chaplain, that was one of the things I, I discovered was that the concept of time is very different depending on your age. Yeah. So high school students would come in and say, Father, I've really been struggling with this for a long time. Yeah. And I'd say, when did the struggle begin? It's about two weeks ago. Yeah. So that's not a long time. <laughs> that's two weeks. But right. if you think about it, in the life of a high school student. It's a long time. On Monday you could come in and if you miss a homework assignment, that could affect your grade in that class. If by Friday you have a test in right. the same class and you don't do well on that test, that could impact your grade for the entire semester. One week can actually have a profound effect on a lot of things for you for that entire semester, which yeah. is a big deal. Yeah. So in fact, for a high school student, a week can be a long right. time. And that's where their mind is. Right. You know, That's the thing. And so being able to recognize the stages of development um, and how that coincides with the prayer life. Yeah. It's, it's in, it's, in, it was fascinating for me because that just for me personally explains so much about myself. And I was like, wow, this is really great. Um, but not to confuse desolation, which sometimes can be answered with, okay, are you eating well? Are you sleeping well? Mm -hmm. Are you taking like the natural parts of your life? How is that going? Yeah. Because then you, then it makes more sense that that phrase that you hear often grace, <clears throat> grace builds on nature. So once the natural part of you is really taken care of, matured, and you know, you've got a rhythm, grace abounds even more. But there's a confusion when you're first beginning where you equate the the stuff that you're struggling with that actually might just be coming from your own humanity with spiritual attacks. I'll give you an example of this, okay? <sighs> so the other day, and I'm saying like the other day by two months ago. I was, I left late from St. Pius. I was driving home. It was like 10 o'clock and all of a sudden I thought I was having an anxiety attack and I started freaking out. Like my heart was palpitating. My mind was like, I'm having a spiritual attack. Like I was freaking out. Father Sam, like freaking out. So I started praying my rosary. I was like, blessed mother, like cover me. Like I just, I mean, I started doing deliverance prayers in the car. Like, I'm just like, what is going on? About an hour later, I get home. I mean, I didn't take an hour to get home, but like an hour later, once I got home, it was like 11 o'clock. I remembered, oh, I had 20 ounces of coffee at 4 p.m. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> so what happened to me wasn't a spiritual attack. No, you're just you're on just the natural like, level. I just had way too much caffeine yeah. <laughs> that it gave me an anxiety attack. That's fantastic. And I was like, this. I mean, first, I thought that was the best example of like, okay, here's not what spiritual warfare is but so often that's that's the role of a spiritual director too yeah. is to say have you considered these other things that are going on not to minimize the spiritual component right but to remind you that we are a unity of body and soul exactly and so there are there are lots of things that can be going on so what else is happening in your life that is is part of this i, I find that a lot as a confessor mm. that helping people to to look at the other things that are going on in their lives helps them to see why they might be more prone to certain sin mm -hmm. or why they might be struggling in it in a particular way. Yeah. Um, obviously not to make that the only reason or to just blame sin on right. other stuff. You don't want to over. Life, yeah. But to help them just to realize so that they can hopefully overcome those sins in the future. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's a delicate balance. You don't want to over spiritualize everything. Right. And so, and this comes with time and just allowing yourself, especially as everybody grows in their own personal relationship with God. Um, you're going to begin to see how, you know, God in a way is ordering your humanity with the divine life of himself like that. Right. That's the rest of our life as Christians. It's, it's literally this reordering yeah. until we get to heaven and then the resurrection happens and we're united with our body. And it's like it. the full, the full vision of it. So, so that was, that was that. All right. Are you ready to move on to week two? We are moving on to week two. We're in Arizona where the Heat is dry and the desert is beautiful and I have plans to retire there. Oh, I love it. When will you retire? I don't know. So I'm looking right now at another, I think minimum, minimum 32 to 35 years before I'll be able to retire. I think mine is between 40 and 45. Okay. Yeah. It'll be a long time. That's because of the age difference between me and Paula, not because it's only seven years. she has to work so much harder. Actually, maybe it's only six. I actually don't think I'll ever retire. I don't, I don't think From I'll, the Lord's work? I don't think Who I'll, would? I don't think I'll ever have the, the joy of retirement. I can't. 
I can't do any, I can't do anything else besides ministry. So I always remember a couple years ago when, when we were in Arizona together, I'm sorry I couldn't go with you this year. That's okay. Um, I didn't need you. Based on, no, based on some of your stories, I think you did. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that maybe just a little bit for comic relief. At the end, oh okay? my gosh. <laughs> um, but I remember a couple years ago when I was at this same, well, I'll let you talk about it, but, yeah. um, there was a priest there who was 82 Oh yeah, yeah. and they introduced him and they talked about how he does all this youth ministry. And his one piece of advice to the priests there was, you don't have to be young to successfully help young people. Mm -hmm. You just have to be there for them. And he said, there's a lot of young priests who I do youth ministry with, and they're able to get way more involved than, than I can. He said, but I can sit there and hear confessions, and I can be there. Mm -hmm. And they know that I'm there for them, and I pray for them, and they know that I'm praying for them. And he said, so don't ever stop doing this just because you're getting older. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to a lot of younger priests. And I, I took that very much to heart. Don't ever stop doing this just because you're getting older. And, and I appreciated that one very much. So I'll expect seeing you around at 82. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> I'm there. All right. So you went to Arizona yeah. where it was beautiful and warm and dry and a desert, but it is, beautiful. It is the preferred place for me. Okay. And why were you in Arizona? So Life Teen has this annual uh, youth minister ministry. <laughs> Words are hard. It's okay. Words are hard. English is hard. Um, youth ministry convention. So normally they get about 800 people to come to this convention all over the country. Some internationally, about 500 actually joined. Um, the majority of them were first time people, wow. um, who had ever started life team or been to the conference. So that was really beautiful to see after a really hard year for youth ministry, uh, across the globe, essentially, uh, just to be renewed and be reconfirmed in the mission to the youth. Because uh, youth ministers got there and they were tired. <laughs> they were tired. They're like, we feel like we failed. All these things are coming out of like restrictions or every place was different. Um, a lot of people suffered. And it, just, it was just a place to just rest um, and be taken care of by Life Teen. So Life Teen just did a phenomenal job with that. Yeah. And it was really great. Uh, for me, for that week... It was, whew, when I said Jesus did a lot, he did a lot. Uh, where do I begin? Yeah, like here, to... begin here. All right, first, <laughs> redact all the names. All right, we're not going to talk about people by name. We're not. No, we're not. Um, but there's there's a beauty in, in what you do there uh, because, first of all, you're, you're there to allow Life Team to minister to you. Yeah. And this is, I think, one of the great strengths of a program like Life, an organization like Life Team. They know that the people who are on the ground doing the ministry, who are, are, are there in it every day, need a place where they can be refreshed. Mm -hmm. The importance of that for your own formation, for your own sanity. If you're out there doing youth ministry every day, if you're, if you're working in a parish every day, at, at a certain point you need to take a step back and just regather your strength. You yeah. need to, you need to get your mind back in order. You need to get your prayer back in order and you need to see other people who are also doing this right. with you. Cause you get into the, the temptation. I'm doing this by myself. Right on. You know, especially if you are like me, a staff of one for youth ministry, you're like, dang it. <laughs> and like, thankfully father Sam is like a youth ministry priest. So that really helps. But, um, forming, creating nights, it's, it, 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 it it's taxing. Uh, for me, it was very healing. Um, I was placed in a place of ministering to other people. So receiving people talking with them. And at the same time I was, I had encounters where it actually healed me mm. of some past wounds. I think the benefit of a convention like that is because you're with people who are in a similar position, mm -hmm. you can go and you're going to find somebody at that convention who can understand the struggle that you have right, and help build you up. Right. And Or you can meet somebody who comes to you, who starts talking to you with their particular struggle. And because you understand it, because you've been through it, you minister to them yeah. and bring them to a place of, of greater healing. Yeah. So pretty much both of the things were happening, That's awesome. uh, which can't underestimate the gift of community and like how God really truly uses community to, I guess, I don't know if this is proper to say it, but to, to give grace or to like allow yourself to experience the father's heart in so many ways. Yeah. Oh, God definitely works through a community of people. Yeah. And especially through a community of people who are striving to minister and yeah. to bring his presence. Into is the it world. right then to say like that a community is almost sac like a sacramental? 
Sacramental, yes. Right, yes. but in like a rosary, well, if, like if it you, reminds you. Or... Yeah, again, look at Lumen Gentium. Yeah. Uh, and Vatican II talks about this, that the church is like a sacrament in the world. That's the, awesome. The church like, is like yeah. a sacrament. So in other words, God's healing grace comes in through the church right. for the world. And what's the purpose of a sacrament? The sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ that to confers give, grace. Exactly, to give grace. So God's grace is going to flow through the church. Now that's the church you know, in the big sense, that's also the church in those very individual communal senses of here's this small group of people. We share in the same work, we share in the same ministry, just in different places, mm -hmm. just with, with different backgrounds. But God wants to work through that small group just the same. Yeah. And that's what reignited me was the importance of like, when I get back home, it's community, it's community. I know I've been talking about it a lot, but even just for me to be reinvigorated and reminded in a personal way, why this is important. Um, God wants to do magnificent things through that. So by the end of, uh, life team, the convention, it, it was just a really good reminder. Life team, the convention, the convention. Um, it was really good. Spaceballs, the lunchbox. <laughs> it was really good. I got to give a shout out to sister Josephine Garrett. Um, that woman triggered me. <laughs> so she in, had in a good way, in a very good way. Okay, she, good. she had this whole talk on, uh, trauma and I was stationed, so I'm an area of contact, so I had a role the entire week, which was to be at breakout rooms and just monitor, like, uh, how many seats, and if we need more, just get some more. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, so I picked her talk, and I was like, oh, dang it. This, she started talking. She started explaining emotional, uh, mental trauma, all these things, like family stuff. And I just like, great, now I'm crying in the back of the room. And uh, I was supposed to hang out with another uh, former missionary. And I was like, no, I got to go to hang out with Jesus now for an hour. Um, but it was necessary because what happened. So she triggered you to go pray. Yeah, she did. Saying. No, she really, she triggered. I was like, all right, Jesus, we got to talk about things that, things that I don't want to talk about with the Lord or things that, why am I not over this yet? Mm. You know, I think that was the thing. Like, I should be over this by now. It's been years, but it's still in there. And a memory had popped up and I was on, I guess I can call it the freeway because it's the West Coast. I was on the freeway in Arizona and a memory had popped up from my childhood. I just started crying. Mm. And there was a Maverick City music song that was playing on the radio that was like, God, you make all things new. Like you bring beauty into at like from Ash. And then I was like, this is too much right now. Jesus, I don't want to do this in the car. But it was very clear the memory that was popping up that the Holy Spirit was bringing about. The song was not helping, although it was. <laughs> um, and and Sister Josephine's talk, by the time just coming back and just recognizing there's still a lot of like my own trauma that I need that Jesus wants to answer and, sure. and to heal. Um, and he was like, you need to take care of this. Like, I, and, and it was just, it was it, for me, that was a really beautiful thing to be personally reminded of it because I can be in such a ministry mode and always serving others that I'm very neglectful of myself. Sure. And that was the whole thing with life team that week is you, your kids are worthy of a good, healthy youth minister. If you're not, then get out. Like that's how they put it. And I was like, yeah. you're right. Well, cause otherwise the, the damage is too great. It's too great. Yeah. You are going to hurt teens because of your inability to be present to them. And there's no time for that right now. Or go and take care of yourself. Take a year or two away from ministry. That might be the better thing for you to do. So I love how they were very upfront about this, but also really caring for you. It's you're worthy of being taken care of. But if this is taxing and if there's no joy in you, if you're not, you know, you're not in a place where you can truly give, um, but also be ministered to yourself, it's okay to take a step back. Yeah. You know, the, the, that question, though, that was coming up for you about why am I not over this yet? Yeah. Don't you see, though, how there's that, that place where you start healing? Mm -hmm. you, you start to confront those, those important things that have happened in your life. And as you confront them and as you bring them to the Lord for mercy, for healing, for his grace, he enlightens you. He lets you see what they are. He lets you understand them better. So you start growing. But then there's that other memory that pops up, something that had been long forgotten. Yeah. And the Lord's saying, I want to heal that too. And I'm like, no touchy. You're right. <laughs> but you're sort of looking at it and saying, why am I not over this yet? And he's yeah. saying, because you haven't brought it to me yet for healing. So there's that that ongoing progress. And this yeah. is the thing with conversion too, right? Mm -hmm. I always tell people about the this nun who I know who whenever 
we stop a conversation or, or you know, stop see, like we leave each other, you know, so she's here and I visiting the convent or something. When I leave, she always say, pray for my conversion. Mm. And I go, I'm thinking to myself, sister, I think you are way beyond conversion. Mm. You are way further along the process. Pray than for I am, my refinement. For sure. Yeah. But she's saying yeah. pray for my conversion because yeah. there's always more, there's always, there's always more the Lord wants to do. There's always more that, that I can bring to the Lord And so I want to be completely converted to him. I want to be always turned towards the Lord. So part of that, that ongoing healing, and this is what that, that talk did for you, Mm -hmm. that talk that sister gave pulled something out that you didn't realize was still there. That was the annoying part. I started crying and I didn't know why. I was like, sister, stop. But what did that do? It drove you to go pray. Yeah. So that the Lord could show you something. And then cry on the freeway in Arizona. Yeah. (laughs) Where else would you cry? I mean, really? Uh, But it brings you to that place where you can, you can bring that more to the Lord and that healing can continue. Yeah. So in the end, that's, that's very great. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's wrap up with, tell me about poolside life. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna end on a, on a funny note because this is humorous oh and I'm going to give some commentary about this. Well, he shall not be named. So anyways, um, at the end of Life Teen Nights or like in the evenings for these conventions, people usually hang out at the bar or they go to like poolside and just like talk and, you know, gather. And <laughs> this this fella approached me and this other youth minister from Connecticut. We were kind of hanging out. Um, we were like, oh, you know, I don't know. I think we want to go to bed. Like we're from the East Coast. Like. It's just a different time zone. We were dead by nine. Sure. So anyways, we, this guy follows us, introduces himself. He's no, a youth. hang on. Can, can we just, yeah. let, let's clarify, follows us. Oh, well, I'm so sorry. He approaches, I'm sorry. He stalking. approaches us at the Life Teen Connect Center. <laughs> I have okay. no idea who this guy is. I just want to defend him a little bit. Oh, no, you can defend <laughs> I didn't mean follow, but he, he's definitely <laughs> sanguine. So if you're not familiar with the, tam- the temperaments, it's a really fun thing to do. Um, but sang- I believe that's pronounced sanguine. Is it? No. No. Oh. Oh, that's me being gullible. Which means he's very like friendly, center of attention, very gregarious. Yes. It just can easily make friends. So I was like, dang, this guy is super sanguine and I'm a little tired of it. <laughs> You're analyzing his personality traits. Well, the and- thing is he analyzed mine. He goes, What's what's your uh, Myers Briggs? And I was like, uh, INFJ. He goes, he completely described me. Yeah. Can and I, I just like, can I just say that that's the weirdest pickup line ever? Well, I don't even know if it was. So to be what's a... your what's your Myers Briggs personality type? <laughs> well, we first started with the temperaments. Yeah. <laughs> and well, he first asked us, hey, where are you guys from? What do you do? Also, okay, that's is... normal. That's a conversation right. and started. Then, that's fine. And I can then and then that. it moved into temperaments. All right. So he was leading the All conversation. Right. So he was like, hey, why don't you guys hang out with us? A couple of us are hanging out poolside with some other people. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. So we go and meet him. Um, oh, strange part is he actually. I forgot about this. He actually knew one of the students of mine when I was at the Coast Guard Academy. Okay. And I was like, whoa, That's small world. Well, the Catholic world is extremely small. You're always going to run into people who, know, who yeah. know your people. Yes. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. It's always going to happen. So we find a little bit more of this fella. Um, he was in the seminary for six years, been doing youth ministry now for the last year. And uh, I really personally thought he was kind of going after my friend, the mm-hmm. other youth minister I was with. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. So anyways, we end up meeting, um, I'm talking to one of his core team members. He's been on core for 20 years. And I was like, Mrs. Visser, if you're listening to this, <laughs> we expect you to be on core for that long. Yes, we need you for a long time. We do. Um, but she'll be in a wheelchair <laughs> by she'll then. So I was talking to him and this other guy, and I was in a place of just ministering to this other, per- this other youth minister because he was kind of struggling. And so our conversation kind of goes, and he's there, but he's like sporadic. He's like all over the place, this, this guy from Florida, this youth minister from Florida. So we're hanging out by the pool, by the pool side, not in the pool. And then he turns around to my friend, the other youth minister, and he's like, hey, so what's the most interesting interesting thing that's happened to you this year? And she's like, well, I'm, I'm going to get engaged pretty soon. She hadn't got engaged yet, but she know the timeline is within the next month. Within about three minutes. Well, first he had finished off her entire like dish of fries. Three minutes later, got up and left. So he finished her food. <laughs> he finished her food. And then left. And then left. Now, I stayed at the pool for two hours. Pers- um, well, yeah, she had left. And I stayed at the pool for two hours talking to this person. Every time I looked up, the youth minister from Florida, the ex-seminarian, was bouncing from a different girl. For the last two hours. Uh, well, okay. Right. Okay. But he just like, he just, he just kept going all over the place. And then one of the guys that I was talking to, the one that I was ministering to, he goes, slowly, he just says quietly, he goes, looks like he's looking for his next vocation. <laughs> and I just, and I just lost 
<laughs> it's funny. All right, let so, me let let me explain a little bit about what happens to to a, an ex seminarian trying to figure out his life. Okay, now. <laughs> I am an ex-seminarian because I'm a priest. Okay, but yes. <laughs> if, if a guy discerns his vocation. The, the purpose of the seminary is to help a man discern his vocation to priesthood or not to priesthood. Yeah. Right. So a man who has been in seminary formation for a period of time has developed certain habits of prayer, certain habits of, of conversation, certain things that, that he's going to do. When you're in seminary for, let's say, more than three years, those habits become more deeply ingrained because the formation that you have there starts to, starts to really work. And so coming out of seminary formation means that you're really re-entering a world that you're no longer as familiar with in the same way. Yeah. You've been interacting with that world, but in the context of being a seminarian. And so all of a sudden there are certain things, certain rules that you were abiding by mm -hmm. as a seminarian that are no longer going to apply to you in the same way. Right. A seminarian has to keep certain boundaries uh, in the, the things they do. We should all have certain boundaries in our conversations, right? Like oh, virtue yeah. is always important. Yeah. I'm not yeah. suggesting anything For sure. like that. But there are certain things that if you're not in the seminary, nobody really cares. If you, for example, approach a, a young woman at something and go to talk to her and flirt a little bit. Yeah. If you're a seminarian and you're going up and approaching a young woman and flirting, people go, hey. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you, that's not appropriate. Or are you having a vocation crisis, right? Mm -hmm. But another part of it is a guy coming out of the seminary who has discerned out has discerned clearly that God's will for him is not to the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And therefore he's looking because he's motivated to seek the Lord's will and his plan. He's motivated to find someone that the Lord's going to send him as, as a spouse. Right. So he's motivated to, to look, which means he's also motivated to, to date and date intentionally, which oh, yes. is actually a very positive character. Much better than a lot of men out there. But anyways. exactly because he's saying, no, I actually want to figure out if I'm supposed to marry you or not, which yeah. is a, a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the downside is he's six years removed from the dating world. <laughs> And so, or, or however many years, right? Wh whatever it is, that's the number of, that's the amount of time that he's, he's not been in the dating world. So it's going to take him a little while to figure out what he should do. So for example, leading off with a Myers-Briggs question is perhaps <laughs> the worst way to re-enter the dating world. Now I'm saying this 20 years removed from my last date, the yeah. 20th anniversary of my last date just passed. Okay. So I don't know what the date was, but I know that it was 20 years ago yeah. because we're now past the high school graduation season and yeah. it was my senior prom. Yeah. Right. So the, the, the 20th anniversary has just passed. I know exactly <laughs> how bad it would be if I were in the dating world. I know exactly how little I would know about what to do or what to say. So and I know that if I was trying, yeah, I would end up saying a lot of really, really dumb things thinking, oh, this might be interesting. And yeah. I'm discovering, oh, normal people don't want to talk about that. They don't. Right. So <laughs> It's a learning process. So to, to the ex-seminarians who are out there, I just want to say you're going to be okay. Oh, yeah. You're going to be okay. You're going to learn. Are there any ex-seminarians who listen to us? Probably not. Okay. I, we have tens of listeners. Tens. <laughs> tens of them. It's great. And we love them all individually uh, and communally. It's wonderful. Yeah. No, so, all right. But here's what here's what would have happened if I was with you. Because <laughs> I told them the I'm, story. I'm going to tell you what would have happened if, if I was with you. All right. If I was sitting with the two of you, uh, first of all, I don't do poolside. Uh, right. So if, we would just if, hung out by the bar. From, yeah, exactly. I, I just have to be at least one foot closer to Proximity. not yeah. the pool. Yeah. And, and that's, I'm comfortable with that. Like <laughs> if there's another thing, another location that I could be hanging out, as long as I'm one foot closer to that than to the, to the pool, we're, we're good. Yeah. This is my kind of social distancing. Right? <laughs> um, I don't like to swim. I don't like to, so anyway, <laughs> so if I was sitting with you, um, I'd be wearing my collar, so I'm a visible priest. Now, what happens at a convention like that, right? This is this only really works. Well, I, I think it could work anywhere, but it works especially in a Catholic context. Mm -hmm. But even if, if we were at a restaurant or something, uh, let's say we had gone to a trivia night at at a local uh, establishment, and uh, we were we were sitting together, the fact that I have the collar on is going to immediately deaden. <laughs> The, the waters, you know, so the sharks circling are just going to like kind of go away uh, yeah. because there's, there's, because there's, there's a priest there. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. No one, no one, no man, no man wants to hit on a girl when a priest is present <laughs> because that's the weirdest thing he can think to do. A seminarian or a former seminarian, I should say, an ex-seminarian definitely <laughs> does not want to try a pickup line on a female that he was meeting. <laughs> when there is a priest present. So I, 
wish you were there for this. Just doesn't want to try it. All right. But here's what would have happened. I, I, I'm telling you this is how the story would have gone down. Oh, my gosh. If he was interested in talking to you guys. Yeah. All right. He would express that interest by engaging me in conversation. Right. He knows that to talk to you, he has to talk to me. Now, this is a little bit of spiritual authority. This is a little bit of spiritual fatherhood. Yeah, it is. That I am here with my spiritual daughter, so you better not talk to my spiritual daughters without yeah. my consent, yeah. or without my permission. <laughs> not that I have any reason to give permission for anything like that. I have no right to any of that, you know, really. You're free to talk to whoever you want. Go ahead. I don't mind. It doesn't bother me. But <laughs> he would have to talk to me. He would. And he would know that, and it would be unspoken. It would be an unspoken rule that he has to talk to me. And all and if if, for example, he was talking to you and didn't realize that that we were part of the same group or something, uh -huh. all that would have to happen would be for you to say, Hey, Father Sam, let me introduce you to done. <laughs> Awkward hitting on situation <laughs> over. You would have saved her so much grief. But see, here's my favorite part about it is I'm I'm not an intimidating human. Yeah. I'm not big enough to be intimidating. I'm not mean enough to be intimidating. Um the best way to describe my, my fighting style is not, <laughs> you know, so there's, there's really not anything about me that's going to scare anybody off. But the fact that I'm, I'm a priest in that situation would be enough to say, uh, it's not worth it. It's so funny. Cause my friend, she said, I know what he's doing. And she just wanted to know when the right time was to say that she was going to get engaged. I love that she dropped she, it and knew it. And she, she was had, like, now's the appropriate time. She held on to that. But that's, <laughs> see, that's, that's good discernment. And that's also kindness. Yeah, it was. So in other words, she was very kind yeah. to engage this guy in conversation. Yeah. Um, very kind to him, which is, which is a good thing because not for nothing, a, a guy honestly coming right out of the seminary is also, there's a little bit of a hurt that comes. Yeah. If you go to the seminary for a couple of years, you've been discerning your vocation, trying to figure it out. You think I'm going to become a priest. And then you realize the Lord's not calling me to that. There's a certain pain of returning to the world because what if people think that I'm a failure? What mm. if people think that I, I got kicked out? Not that I discerned and that I'm seeking God's will, mm -hmm. but what if they think that I'm not good enough to be a priest or something? Or there's that little bit of self-doubt. Like so, For so many years, I've identified as a seminarian. I'm preparing yeah. for the priesthood. And all of a sudden, that aspect of my identity is gone. Mm -hmm. So to have someone engage with you kindly and be nice to you and talk to you and, and make you feel like, I'm not a total freak for wanting to talk to people. Yeah. That's a great kindness. Now, yeah. at the same time, she did the right thing by not allowing that to go any further and just saying, <laughs> I'm getting engaged soon. Here's the trump card. <laughs> you may now talk to me about my future plans for, for marriage with the man who I love, or you may uh, walk away from this entire conversation. And pursue someone else at the Please pool. feel free. So it was like, it, that was, that was a, a charitable thing to, to yeah. allow that conversation to happen. It was yeah. a charitable thing to put the, the evidence out there that this isn't going anywhere. It was also a charitable thing to give him the out. Yeah. So I mean, all in all, I'm very proud of you guys. Uh, and, uh, again, all you former seminarians who might be out there, you're going to be okay. Honestly, it's the just most entertaining in thing. Just hang out at Catholic youth ministry conventions or Catholic things. There's, I mean, honestly, they should make a show about this. The, this is too much. The Catholic reality uh, dating show? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The real world. Scary, scary Catholic watching. Real. Scary. Listen, Paula, I'm really glad that you're back. Yeah. Um, I'm glad to see you. And, and then we leave again. We are about to, folks, by the time you hear this, we will be back and we might have to talk about what it was like to, to go on a bus for, for what, 24 you hours? You will experience it for about 20 hours. I will experience it for 40. Yeah, I only get to experience the first leg, the return trip. I'm, I'm totally taking the pastor's way out. I, I'm not ashamed of it at all. <laughs> I, I, and I invite you to do that. So I, I want you to do that. We're taking a bus trip with... How many of our teenagers? Um, it'll be 22 of us, so it's like about 27, including chaperones. Okay, so almost 30 people, yeah. mostly teenagers, to Nashville, Tennessee for Catholic Heart Work Camp for a week. I'm actually so excited. Yeah. I'm really fired up about this. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm so glad to be back to Catholic Heart and yeah. to be working with them again. Um, so excited for the kids that, we're, that we get to do this. And, and uh, one of them wanted a long trip, and I was like, oh, yeah. now you're getting it. The, the bus trip part, I'm not as much looking forward to, but I'm, I'm okay for it. And then I'm... Uh, I'll be honest. I am really thrilled to fly home instead of. Of course you are. With you guys for another couple of weeks. I need to be functional for the weekend. That's you do. All. Like, you I do. Really and truly need to be able to function. This, yes, this and I weekend. give you. Yeah, you are allowed to do that. I'm grateful for your permission. <laughs>
But the thing was, I made a point like you have no choice but to join me on the first part of the trip. No, and that's that's true. That's a reasonable thing. I know it's a tough trip, so yes. I'm excited about it. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a great time. Folks, thank you for listening. This is uh, Roar Like the Lamb. I'm Father Sam Kachuba. And I'm Paula Peña. God bless you. 